Hey, everybody. Happy Wednesday. How's it going? Good to see everybody here. Got a good turnout so far. Um, it's a Wednesday. It's beautiful. And I hope you guys are ready. We're actually going to be spending a little time talking about tuning. It's one of those things that every string player, every violinist, every musician, really, apart from piano players, uh, but we all struggle with it. Every musician does, especially string players, because we're playing these crazy fretless instruments with these super, super short scale lengths. So like even a millimeter difference on your left hand is pretty significant when you're listening to, to hear what your intonation is going to be like. These things are really hard to play in tune, and we spend a huge part of our career basically trying to figure out how to play these things in tune and then keeping that skill once we've got it. So, yeah, it is maybe the most important aspect of playing the violin, maybe apart from tone production with your bow. So intonation with the left hand, tone production with the right hand. It's probably the two most important things that we think about with the instrument. And it turns out that a lot of people don't really understand the science behind tuning and intonation and this 12 note chromatic scale that we use in Western music. So I thought we'd spend a little time kind of spending, uh, you know, do a little bit of nerding out and figuring out what is the science behind this? What is the difference between just and equal temperament and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, good, good stuff. So anyway, we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to get a little bit nerdy and uh, that's cool. Yeah. So there are 12 notes in the Western European scale, the Western European um, classical influenced scale. There are 12 notes per octave. Obviously, Eastern scales are different, especially Indian scales. They've got what over 40 notes in them or something. And the more we get into this, the more you'll figure out why there are so many notes in other uh, cultural scales. But because of Western notation and the way that it influenced later music, like rock and... <clears throat> Excuse me, that was really crazy. I must be allergic to something. Um, the way Western European music influenced rock and jazz and country and all those other styles of music that we listen to now, this 12-note scale... Goodness. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. This 12-note chromatic scale has become very ubiquitous in the musical world. How did we get, how did we pick 12, right? How did we pick 12 notes in an octave? Well, I'll tell you. It starts out with frequency relationships. If we look at the octave itself, there's a two-to-one relationship in the frequency of a note and the frequency of the next octave up or down. So if we think of open A on a violin being 440 hertz, the next A up is 880. So uh, third finger on the E string, 880 hertz, open A 440. And then first finger on the G string, the next A down is 220 hertz. There's a two to one relationship between those frequencies. And you can see a little wavelength thing here. You can see like the red one maybe would be A 440 and the blue one would be A a 880. So you can see where they cross the axis there, the horizontal axis, that there's a lot of there's a lot of nodes where they cross and your ears can hear that. And that's a it's a very familiar sound when you know what an octave sounds like that when those nodes are hitting as often as they do, it's a very distinctive sound and it's a thing that's very comfortable and it feels very stable and it's because of physics. It's a 2 to 1 relationship in those frequencies. Another very, very stable relationship and one that your ears very much want to hear is that three to two relationship. It's the fifth. So open A being 440 hertz. Then you go up to open E. There's a three to two relationship between those frequencies. And you can see on this graph here that, you know, there, there are a bunch of nodes on that horizontal axis and your ear hears those as well. And when you hear a fifth a perfect fifth played in tune, there's a very stable and um, pleasing quality to that sound. And it has to do with, you know, the, the relationship of those frequencies to each other. So why do we talk about that? It's the circle of fifths. If you start on a note, say a C, and you go up a fifth to a G, and up a fifth to a D, and up a fifth to an A, and up a fifth to an E, and then to a B, and F sharp. So we're going up all these fifths, if you go up 12 times, you end up back at a C. 
you end up back where you started, sort of. So it's this circle of fifths. It's 12 times. It's 12 notes. That's why we end up with a 12 note chromatic scale. We just take that circle of fifths, take all those notes, and then we just put them in sort of chronological order. And that makes them, that makes a chromatic scale that is 12 notes from C to C or D to D or G sharp to G sharp, whatever. It is 12 notes per octave, 12 chromatic tones per octave. Now, when we use our ears to gauge this, on a fretless instrument, you play a note on your fingerboard and you actually move your finger around until that note sounds right. Because if we ask if the A440, okay, A is 440 hertz, well, what's C sharp? Well, what frequency would C sharp be? It turns out that, that it depends. It depends on what key we're in. You go, oh my goodness, this is very difficult. This doesn't really make sense. Well, I got a really quick demo for you and, and I'm, gonna let you, I'm gonna let you hear this demo and then we'll come back and talk a little more. When we talk about sounding right, we're gonna use our ears to listen to what these intervals sound like when they're played together. We're listening to this fifth. And now it sounds like it's in tune, right? So we'll do the same thing with a major third. adjust that until it sounds in tune. Let's try it with a minor third. You can hear where it sounds like it's in tune, but if we put a tuner on those, they're not exactly right. That's right. So that is where we bump into the difference between just temperament and even temperament. And that was good, Stephen. This is a well-tempered talk. Um, I'm very seldom considered a well-tempered guy. Um, the redhead, the red hair, it's, yeah, anyway. Um, Hot-tempered, maybe that's where we got it. Just temperament, even temperament, and hot temperament. Um, so it actually started with keyboard instruments. Where, where are we really trying to figure out this just versus equal temperament? And the way you've got a piano, if you try to tune the piano or the harpsichord or whatever you're tuning to where the notes all sound right, it doesn't work. You can't take a C and then you tune D to sound right and then E to sound right and F and because they won't sound right in between, right? So they basically had to decide that we've got a C to a C and we're gonna take one twelfth of the difference and we're gonna split the difference equally mathematically and we're just gonna assign those differences to these notes. They don't sound right when you do that and what basically happens is you end up with an instrument that's equally out of tune in every key. Because if you tune your, your harpsichord to the key of C, then it would sound great if you were playing in C. But if you tried to play in A, it would sound horrible. It would sound really, really out of tune. So the even temperament, equal temperament, is what we did to make a compromise so that you could play music in more than one key on that instrument. And Bach actually wrote a piece called the Well-Tempered Clavier. Uh, clavier, clavier. And that's what happens in the South. He's playing the, that piano. Um, the Well-Tempered Clavier was, was written for this instrument that was, that was designed to be out of tune. So I've got some, let's see if I can take some of these um, questions. Hey, what's up, Ken? Mohammed, hey everybody, good to see you guys. Um, the question, does a bridge affect your tuning? I, I may have to address that with you. You can send us a, uh, just send us an email and we'll see if we can figure that out. Send us an email, info at electricviolinshop.com. I'll try to figure out exactly what you mean by that and then uh, get that question answered for you. Um, have not heard this, but uh, I would like to. So I may do that after uh, after we finish up here. So I've got a couple of graphs. Everybody sort of visualizes things and understands things in a different way. So I've got a couple of different ways to visualize this. Um, and I put the credit for who developed these graphs at the bottom. Um, but this one is an equal temperament where, you know, we've laid out that keyboard in 12 equal steps. And then 
how out of tune are each of those notes to what our ears want to hear? So you'll see that minor second if we go from C to C sharp. The C sharp on a piano that's in equal temperament is actually 12 cents flat from what your ear wants to hear. Uh, when you go to D, C to D is pretty close. It's only four cents off. When you go to E flat, from C to E flat, that E flat is very flat. 16 cents flat, like significantly flat compared to what your ear wants to hear. When you go to E natural, the major third, it's actually 14 cents sharp. There is a 30 cent difference between those two notes and how they're going to feel to you. So that's, that's how out of tune a piano is. Pianos are actually quite out of tune. Um, so if you're trying to use a piano or, and this is also with a tuner, if you're, if you're using a tuner with your violin to try to get your intonation right, the tuner's going to be wrong, like quite wrong. And depending on the interval, that, that tritone, the C to F sharp, that is very, very, very out of tune. A tritone on a piano is significantly out of tune. Um, and that's why they just, they just don't sound the same as your violin sounds if you're playing your violin well and you're using just intonation. Uh, and everybody will talk about guitars being fretted instruments. Guitar, guitar players, good ones, can, can actually adjust their intonation quite well. And, you know, a guitar is a fretted instrument. It's going to play in, in equal temperament. No, it's not. A good guitar player can play in just temperament, even with a fretted instrument. And we can do the same thing with fretted violins. But anyway, just to show you this graph that pianos and tuners are actually significantly out of tune. So this is another uh, visualization of that. You can see sort of the, the just intonation versus well-tempered. Just intonation on the top here is what your ear wants to hear. And then underneath uh, well-tempered or even-tempered is what your, what your keyboard actually is. So you can see the space. If you look over here, the space between re and, and ri, or re, ru, um, it's, that's huge. That's a huge space. So when you're playing your scales, that space from, uh, from two to three in your scale is sig significant right? That's a, that's a big space. So it's, it's different for a piano than it is for a violin or an instrument that actually can play in tune. Um, and it's funny because we're the instrument that struggles so much with intonation, but you think a oh, piano, they don't have to worry about intonation. No, they're just always out of tune. So these are things that you have to think about when you're playing with a piano. If the piano is your accompanist, uh, you got to sort of decide, am I going to try to be in tune with myself or am I going to be in tune with the piano? And maybe I'm splitting the difference. Maybe I'm making some artistic decisions here. Um, which notes I'm going to play in tune and which notes I'm going to play out of tune with the piano. Just things to think about. Uh, and then here's for the, the spreadsheet nerds here. We've got the, uh, each one of those notes and what your ear wants to hear, which is in that first column, the ratio to fundamental just scale. And then the second column, racial fundamental equal temperament, that's, uh, that's the difference. So thought you guys might enjoy seeing some of these, uh, some of these different graphs. The, the first one is the one that resonates the most with me, but one of these other ones might resonate more with you. So that's why we have them. So when we talk about perfect force and perfect fifth, a so perfect fourth is just an inverted perfect fifth. They're not actually that perfect on the instrument. And it turns out in your circle of fifths, you go, well, okay, we're just going to use a circle of fifths. We're not going to worry about this equal temperament nonsense. The circle of fifths, if we do a perfect fifth to a perfect fifth to a perfect fifth, and we follow that three to two ratio all the way around, it should end up perfectly back on an octave, right? An octave. What happened to me? An octave. So that sounds very, uh, I'm very British. Have a bottle of water. So, um, yeah, that circle of fifths, if we follow it all the way around, it should end up perfectly back in tune, right? No, it does not, actually. Um, there's a thing called a Pythagorean comma, and this is maybe like super hyper nerdy for you, but it quantifies the discrepancy. If we do 12 fifths stacked on top of each other, that ends up being seven octaves. 
And if we go C all the way around the circle of fifths back to C, our new C is seven octaves higher than the original C, but it's out of tune by 23 cents. So even if we follow the circle of fifths and we do that three halves ratio all the way around, you still end up about 23 cents out of tune over those seven octaves. So it's, it's very, it's impossible to play in tune. It can't be done, right? That's pressure's off, fellas. You don't even have to try to play in tune. It can't be done. Math. It's math. It's science. You can't play in tune. There's no such thing. Uh, my teacher would disagree. So all of that is very interesting, right? It's, yeah, that's fascinating, Matt. It's like a, a discovery channel thing. But what has that got to do with me? What's the practical application for me as a violinist who's just trying to get better at playing this horrendously difficult instrument? Well, one of the things that you got to be aware of is when you're tuning your instrument by ear, you, you got to be a little bit careful and you got to understand that when you're tuning those fifths, they're actually, when they sound in tune, they're actually not according to your tuner and according to your piano. It's one of the reasons that orchestras tune to an A because it's one of the middle notes on the violin. If orchestras use an E as their reference tune, when you use, or as your reference tone, when you tune the next string down, your A string, your A string would actually, if you're using your ear, your A string is going to be about two cents flat. And then your D string is now going to be four cents flat. And your G string is now going to be six cents flat. Those, the, ear, the, the fifth that your ear wants to hear is actually a little bit bigger than the equal temperament fifth. So if we tune with the A string, then your E is going to be a hair sharp, D is going to be a hair flat, G is going to be a hair flat, but you, you've only gotten two stack ups there. Your G is only four cents flat now instead of six. Um, but extended range instruments have to think about that a lot. If I use a tuner on the E string on my seven string violin, my A is going to be two cents flat. And then A, you know, a D is going to be four all the way till we get to a B flat string, which is going to be like 14 cents flat. It's like considerably flat. Um, so yes, yeah, sounds like a stage name, 23 cents. I'm like a discount 50 cent. Um, so yeah, this actually makes me feel a lot better because if Yo-Yo Ma can't play in tune, my God, nobody's got a chance. And, and cellos are actually more forgiving than violins because you've got a longer scale length. A millimeter difference on a cello is not as many cents different as, as a millimeter difference on a violin. Um, but it means two things. Either one, there's hope for me that I'm just going to have to be equally as out of tune as Yo-Yo Ma, or it means that his ear is so much better than mine. <laughs> that everything I play is going to sound out of tune to him. So I don't know, maybe that, maybe that knife cuts both ways. So extended range violins, if you use a tuner to tune your E string and then use your ear to tune the rest, by the time you get to that F or that B flat string, they're going to be significantly out of tune. So what do I do? Do I, do I use a tuner to tune all of my strings? Well, they're not going to be in tune when I go to play open power chords or whatever. So you may have to make some compromises. If I, if I play a lot of power chords on my bottom two strings, I may use a, a tuner to tune my C string and then use my ear to tune my F string. And yeah, it's going to be a couple cents flat, but that's just kind of how it is. Uh, so that way my, my parallel fifths will actually be in tune. And yes, I love playing parallel fifths uh, to all the composition majors. Um, so... Yeah, so, okay, this is a great question. Singing, match the piano or the violins or they follow the singer? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, you just basically have to make some decisions. And here's the other thing. I was a, a, a background singer for a lot of years in a band. And what if my lead singer is out of tune? What if the person singing lead is a little bit sharp versus the guitars? Do I sing sharp with them? Do I split the difference? You know, what do I do? Um, and basically, you, you just kind of have to use your artistic sense and you have to use your ears and just make the decision that sounds the best to you. And it may be different from note to note. So, yeah, it's, it's hard. Uh, it's, it, music's a lot harder than it sounds at first. So here's another practical application. You got to be aware when you're playing with pianos or fretted instruments um, that 
just temperament and equal temperament are very different, especially depending on the note. If we're talking about a tritone or a minor third, like it's significantly different. Um, so you're going to have to kind of make some decisions. Uh, fretted violins need to be very aware. Uh, we just had somebody the other day return to fretted violin because they were like, I'm sitting here with a tuner and I just can't get it in tune. Uh, you know, this, this instrument won't play in tune. Well, it will. Uh, the first thing you have to understand is that frets are not magic. They are there as, um, they're there as landmarks. When we look at a, a fretless violin, We've just got this vast expanse of ebony here and there's like, no, there's nothing to tell me where I am on the neck of this violin. It's just, it's just this vast expanse of ebony. With a fretted violin, here we go. With a fretted violin, you've got some landmarks on there and maybe these things aren't perfect, right? I'm, I may not be exactly on that fret, but it gives me a reference point to know that's where the equal temperament note would be. And then maybe I need to be a little flat or a little sharp versus where that fret is. And the nice thing about these fretted violins, the frets are low enough that if you're not, you know, using death grip mashing on this thing, that, that your finger basically floats on top of that fret and you can just use it as a tactile reference point to say, okay, that's where the equal temperament note would be. And then I can make my sonic adjustments based on my ear or what I remember on this instrument. So you can't sit with a tuner and necessarily check all these frets to make, oh, this one's not exactly a, a B flat. My A string is exactly in tune, but this B flat is, you know, this first fret, this B flat is not exactly in tune. Well, it won't be by the tuner. It won't sound in tune if you've got it in tune with the tuner. Does that make sense? So just... These are reference points and they are general, general reference points because look back at that chart. Look how out of tune a piano actually is. That's how out of tune some of these frets are going to be, but they're giving you a reference that you can work with. Does that make sense? You know, and the reason we have fretted violins is because sometimes we're playing on loud, loud, like really loud rock and roll stages and you can't hear your violin all the time. You know, sometimes maybe you step away from your amp or maybe your in-ear battery goes dead or, or something. It's, it's not always, you can't always hear all the way around the edges of every note. And what that fret does is it just gives you a reference point that gets you essentially to equal temperament level intonation, you know, within 10 or 15 cents on a note. And man, you know, in a rock and roll stage, that's a lot better than just floating out there in the wind. You may be twisting away Without frets, you might be, you know, you could have 30, 40, 50 cents worth of problems. And uh, those are 50 cent worth of problems. There's a lot of problems. So that's the reason for frets. They're, they're not for every situation. They're not for every player. But that's why there are fretted violins. And if you have a fretted violin, you need to be aware of the physics behind tuning and why you can't just sit there with a tuner and check every single fret and go, well, this violin doesn't intonate right. So yes, like I said here, and then yeah, your ears will be different. Your ears will hear things differently than your tuner shows you. Is a tuner a good tool for practicing? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty good tool. And depending on which note you're using the tuner to check you in the key that you're in, it's gonna be more or less accurate versus what sounds in tune to your audience. And believe me, your audience doesn't have tuners. They just have ears you should probably play what's going to sound in tune to them rather than what looks in tune on a tuner. So there is, you know, the cool thing about electric violins is we can do stuff that uh, acoustic violins can't do. Like we can run into distortion pedals and you can use a distortion pedal to help you play more in tune. Did you hear what I said? You can use a distortion pedal to help you play more in tune. It is going to, and it doesn't, it, and it's not going to cover up your intonation mistakes. It's actually the opposite of that. Distortion will cover for you on some of your articulation issues, right hand issues. Distortion kind of works like uh, like an airbrush, you know, like the airbrush makeup that I'm clearly not using. Um, 
that, you know, when you're on high def TV and they, they're airbrushing the, the makeup on all these actors and actresses to make their faces look like not mine. Um, the airbrush actually sort of smooths out some of the, the blotches in the skin, right? Uh, distortion will do that for your right hand. It does not do that for your left hand. It's the opposite of that. It's like a makeup mirror that blows up your whole face and you go, oh my God, my pores are like craters. This is what uh, distortion does for intonation. Here's another demo. Remember before we were listening to the violin to hear if certain intervals sounded in tune. It can be a little hard with a clean tone because you don't have a lot of interference between those notes where the frequencies are clashing. But if you add distortion, it actually gets a lot easier. Let's listen to a fifth. <laughs> And now a major third. Here it's coming in. It's way more obvious that that note is now in tune. Distortion actually adds more high frequency artifacts to those sounds and it makes the collisions between the out of tune notes a lot more obvious. So they jump out at you like a lot. Practicing your intonation with distortion reveals a lot of things that you wouldn't hear with a clean tone. So yeah, that's the story with that. And so yeah, distortion is going to help you play more in tune. Tell your teacher, I'm going to go home and I'm going to work on my Bach partitas or whatever. I'm going to play that with distortion, man. It's not because I'm rocking out. It's because I'm making myself crazy because all the notes that I thought were in tune before, I actually find out that they're, they're, they were not in tune. Uh, Chuck Bontrager is a huge proponent of this. Chuck's intonation is like otherworldly. Chuck's intonation is insane. And one of the reasons his intonation is so stinking good is because he's a huge distortion nerd. And he loves practicing his scales and arpeggios and double stops, practicing those when he's using distortion. And it has made his muscle memory incredible. Um, so, yes. Uh, yes, that, that is exactly what I was trying to say, but it didn't come out. Um, yes. Can you, can you reset your tuner to register? No. <clears throat> um, you would have to tell it what key you're in. So I guess in theory, you could get a tuner that you could program to say, okay, I'm in the key of D and I need you to tell me whether these notes are in or out of tune in just intonation rather than equal temperament. Um, but yeah, probably not. I mean, so the idea is the tuner is going to get you relatively close on some notes, um, but your ear is really where it's at. And that's why your teachers will tell you to practice with a drone. They'll tell you to practice. They want you to use your ears because again, tuners are good and they can help you get your open strings in tune, but you're going to struggle if you're only practicing using intonation with a tuner because some notes are just going to be wrong. Uh, what's up, Nick Hyde? Hope you're doing well. Haven't talked to you in a while, my brother. So yeah, I, I highly recommend practicing your scales, doing your, uh, you know, all your double stop practice with distortion. You're going to hate it at first and be like, oh my God, this instrument is impossible to play in tune. Um, cause it more or less is, but, uh, it, it is going to make you a lot better. It's going to make you a lot better player. So that's all the, uh, that's kind of all the slides I got. I'm actually going to take you back and show you guys the graphs again. Um, so this is that first one. This is equal temperament versus just intonation. And the pink bars show you how out of tune a piano is. So these are just kind of things to remember. Like when you're playing your scales that you've got to, uh, you know, you've got to adjust your, your fingers to account for how out of tune these notes are going to be versus uh, equal, um, equal temperament. So, uh, yes, that is exactly right. 
Um, somebody on YouTube is, is talking about this. Yeah, intermodulation wouldn't occur if each string had an individual. Yeah, so if you had the correct number of strings on a violin is six. If you had six pickups and no crosstalk, and each one of those pickups went to a different amplifier, it would sound very different than if one pickup picked up all the strings and went to a single amp. Yes. And that's the thing you'll notice when you're trying to set your distortion levels. If I'm playing single notes, I can set my amp really, really dirty. And I still have a nice cleanish sound on single notes. But the minute I start playing double stops, it's like, it's all crazy. So <coughs> I kind of have to split the difference. I have to make my amp a little cleaner than I want it on single notes. So it ends up just a hair dirtier than I want on double stops. So that's kind of cool. And that's one of the reasons that I really like doing chords and stuff on with distortion is because you get all these new colors and stuff that show up when you're running through distortion and you're playing chords or you're playing uh, some, some different intervals. Mucho menio coloros um, show up. That's, uh, I don't know what language that was. So this is one of those graphs to, to show you how out of tune a piano is. Here's another one, just kind of visualizing that differently. On the bottom, you can see that that's 12 equal steps from do to do or C to C, or if we're doing movable do, it could be any note to any note. Could be G sharp to G sharp. Um, but then your, if you're, um, if you're playing in just intonation, which again, what your ear wants to hear, that those notes are not equally spaced. And then here's the spreadsheet version again for all the, the math nerds. Uh, some of these are actually pretty close. Some of them are actually quite close and some of them are really far off. So <clears throat> just, uh, just some fun there for you guys. And yeah, where am I coming here? Coming here. All right. So any more questions, any more comments, anybody want to say anything? Everybody good? I did show you guys that purple six string fretted Viper that's hanging here. Let me show you again. This is a used instrument that is on our website right now. And uh, it came in and it needed a new pickup in it. And so it's got a starfish pickup on it now. And if you know anything about Vipers, you'll know that the availability of these things, let's just say that the demand outstrips the supply right now. It is nearly impossible to get your hands on one of these right now, but there's one of them right here, right now, in my hot little hands. I almost bought this for myself. I mean, I almost, this almost ended up in my music room. I decided to let it go by, and every time I look at it, I'm rethinking that. But um, yeah, so this one is available. It's on our website. If you go to electricviolinshop.com, uh, it's there. It will not be there for long. So wanted you to be aware of that. The other one that is hanging on our wall that will not be here for very long is this MSI Renaissance. This thing is sweet. This went out to somebody and I, I am stunned every time, but somebody will buy one of these. I don't know. And once in a blue moon, somebody's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't like the way it sounded. <laughs> you should get your ears checked, but uh, it, it came back. So it is hanging here on the wall. It is a new instrument. Somebody had it for like two or three days. And they were like, oh, it doesn't sound like I want it to sound. And went, okay, it, we'll, we'll sell this thing momentarily. So those two instruments are in the shop right now. That's really, really rare for us to have uh, an MSI and a Viper in the shop right now because for both of them, the demand is uh, dramatically outstripping the supply. Uh, hopefully both of those situations will be remedied soon. But um, anyway, yeah. Yeah, you can ask Mark Wood to do a Seafoam Green Viper. That's not a problem. What you are going to be bummed out about is when you find out how long it's going to take to get that. Um, because right now they are in the process of, of tooling up for, they're going to have a number of standard colors that are going to come out of that shop and they are going to be priority. And those things are going to come out relatively quickly. Uh, custom orders are going to be, you're going to need a bigger calendar. 
uh, yeah, they're, they're not going to be, custom orders are going to be very, very, very uh, slow. So do we exchange for credit to purchase there? Uh, we have a 30 day return policy. So if you buy something hanging on this wall and within 30 days you decide, eh, this isn't really for me, send it back, full refund. Uh, you have to pay return shipping. Um, but that's that's what goes on there. Um, so yeah, it's what it does because not everybody can come to the shop and I really recommend you just come to the shop. If you're interested in an instrument, we're 15 minutes from the RDU airport average price on one of these is, you know, you might be spending a couple grand on an instrument, uh, spend a couple hundred and you fly in here and you try every single instrument we got. We got a whole bunch of them. Uh, a, a pretty good percentage of people when they come in here, they've done their research. Hey, I've been watching your videos and I think I want this instrument and they'll come in and they'll try that instrument and they go, man, I really do like it. And I'm like, well, since you're here, that's great. I'm glad you found that instrument. I'm glad you like it. Since you're here and it doesn't cost anything, you ought to try some of these other ones. And it's a very significant amount, percentage of the time, maybe a third or more, that they walk out of here with something other than they thought they were going to buy. Um, yes, the shop is open by appointment only. Um, we're not a very big shop and there's not very many of us here. Um, so rather than risking having two or three people or four people in here at a time, none of you would be able to hear the instrument you're trying to hear. None of you would be able to get the attention that you deserve from the people working here. If we do it by appointment only, we can space them out so that we don't have like four people in the shop at a time. And then everybody has a bad experience. Um, we'd rather have one person in the shop at a time. Uh, probably 98% of our business is, is online. If you can get here, I recommend getting here. If you can't get here, well, the videos on our YouTube channel are going to help you make the best decision that you can. And then you buy the instrument and you don't have to worry about it. If you get it in, you're like, well, what if I spend $3,000 on a violin and I hate it? Send it back. So, um, yeah, we'll work with you on that. We know the deal. We're all, we're all players. Everybody who works here plays electric violin. So we want you to have an instrument that you're happy with. Um, we also need to make money. So we have to have some rules, but how much do you need to adjust your fingers to get in tune, notes in tune on a fretted violin? Um, about this much. You need to adjust your fingers about that much. It depends on the note. Uh, some notes are really close. You know, you look at the minor second, the perfect fourth, perfect fifth, the the, ma the minor seventh. Those those are close, pretty close. You know, two, three, four cents. That's really close. There are other notes like the tritone. Well, you're going to have to adjust quite a bit. So it depends on what key you're in. It depends on what, what interval you're looking at. Um, so yeah, there, there's not a, there's not a, a, a single answer for that. So how much do you need to adjust your fingers? It depends on the note. Uh, if you just blindly use the frets, F this, I'm not paying attention to any of this just intonation nonsense. I just want to use the frets. You're going to be relatively in tune pretty much all the time. You're going to be within 16 or 17 cents of in tune all the time. Um, so yeah, but if you're, if you're a little pickier than that, then you're going to have to make some adjustments. Um, so yeah. So yeah, these are all great questions. Keep these coming. So will I take a kidney for that Viper? Uh, I don't, I'm not in need of a kidney right now. Uh, and my landlord doesn't take kidneys. He only takes cash. So right now we're only doing cash, but you could maybe, you could sell your kidney to somebody else and then use that money to come buy the Viper. I hear you only need one kidney. So, you know, you're good actually. If you sell that kidney, you could probably buy a Viper and a, a bow. So that'd be awesome. Because then you could play it. Yes, Ray, what's happening, brother? The uh, Starfish does sound great on a six-string Viper. I really like the Starfish pickup. Honestly, I'm a Barbera guy, and I've been playing Barberas for 20-some years, uh, and that's that's the sound that I personally like, and I play a lot of really heavy stuff. I need the, the bottom-end thunder that comes with that Barbera, but probably 90% of people are actually going to be happier or at least as happy with a Starfish. To me, they're a little more balanced, 
uh, with the Barberas, those big heavy strings, uh, they actually, my F string is louder than my E string. My low F is louder than my E. That's not the case with the starfish. They're pretty much even. Um, so uh, I actually want that bottom string to be louder. Uh, but a lot of people, they would rather have just have a nice even sound all the way across. Which costs more, the Viper or the bow? Depends on which bow you get. Um, I've got some bows that cost almost as much as a Viper, and I've got some bows that are a lot less. So, yeah, generally what they would say is it's like a two-to-one thing. Uh, that you, Whatever you spend on your instrument, you should spend about half of that on a bow. So if you're looking at a $3,000 violin, you ought to be looking in the neighborhood of a $1,500 bow. Uh, not everybody follows that, but that's that's kind of like the ballpark guideline. So, yeah, if you've got if you've got X budget, you want to think about two thirds to three, you know, between two thirds and three quarters of that budget on the instrument and the remainder on the bow. Uh, that's for an acoustic instrument. For an electric instrument, it's the same ratio for the instrument and the bow, but then you also have to factor in gear and amps and and pedals and wirelesses and all that other stuff. So. There's not really a one size fits all requirement for that. It really depends on what you're doing. Uh, I have gigs where I just use I just use a HX Stomp. It's a little six hundred dollar pedal that I use for for that whole gig, and then I have gigs where I've got three thousand dollars worth of stuff on a pedal board. So it, it totally depends. And I don't ever cart amps. I don't ever use an amp. I'm always direct into a PA with in ears, or ninety percent of the time I'm direct into a PA with in-ears. So then you got your in-ear expense and all that. Kind of, yeah, there's I have a lot of money tied up in stuff. Um, fortunately, you make money with it. But uh, yeah, so it depends. The ratio, that sort of two to one ratio, between two to one and three to one on the instrument to the bow, um, that applies to the instrument and the bow, but then gear is separate from that. And you could end up spending almost as much or more in gear than you have in an instrument. It's not uncommon for a guitar player to spend more on the amp than they did on, on the guitar. So, it do be like that sometimes. Any other questions? This has been really fun. Uh, and if you guys have ideas for video content, like ideas, video ideas for video content ideas, if you have ideas for uh, topics that you want me to cover, uh, you can put those in the comments section and I will I will put that on my list of things to think about. Can't make any promises, but I'll think about it. Thinking right now. So, yeah, I don't know what we're going to be talking about next week, but we'll come up with something and I guess I will see you guys then. So, yeah, if you have ideas for things you would like me to cover, dump those in the comments. If not, we'll, we'll just see you back here next week. I hope this has been informative. I hope you know more about tuning and intonation and scales and just temperament, equal temperament. I hope you know more about that than you did 45 minutes ago. Uh, and if not, uh, I hope that I didn't say anything blatantly wrong. And uh, if I did, correct me. I want to get it right. So, uh, yeah. Thank you guys for hanging out, and I will see you next week.